Um, and come join me now in Moscow, uh, in Russia, a country I went to for the first time in 1989 when it was still the Soviet Union, a country I both love and love to hate, the largest country in the world that spans 11 time zones from Kaliningrad in Europe uh, to Petropavlovsk Kamchatki in the Asia Pacific. How do we understand America's relationship with Russia? It's gone through its ups and downs. Back in the 1800s, we bought Alaska. Uh, from Russia through the Seward Purchase, some called it the Seward Folly. Russia and the United States didn't have much to do with one another, even though Alaska crossed over to us. In World War II, we found ourselves allies. President Roosevelt sitting next to Stalin and Churchill, allies in a united cause that quickly slipped into a Cold War, where for 50 years, US relations with the Soviet Union were deeply problematic and almost led to the deaths of both countries and hundreds of millions of people. Somehow that too quickly gave way to Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin being good buddies after the fall of the Soviet Union. And that turned to Putin destabilizing the United States of America through his own uh, cyber hacking efforts in recent years. It's a troubled history. So you might say, wait a minute, Professor Burke White, you said that these three fundamentals would help us understand consistency in foreign policy over time. How do you explain it with Russia? Well, I'm gonna suggest that there's a lot of balance here between security, intent, and what we believed Russia's values were. Let's start with security. During the Cold War, Russia presented an enormous security threat to the United States. It had enough thermonuclear missiles pointed at the United States to destroy America time and time again. And we had enough pointed back at them to do the same thing. Today, Russia is still the world's second most powerful military with um, uh, more troops um, than the United States, with more tanks than the United States, with more nuclear warheads than the United States. Now, we're stronger on some other dimensions, but you can see how that would present a security threat to Europe and to the United States. But when we think about security, remember, we also have to think about intent. Um, Russia is showing a willingness to use its military power to destabilize Europe. Russia seized the Crimea, the area in gold at the bottom of your map there, from Ukraine and claimed it as Russia's own. It rolled these tanks in and it held a faulty referendum to annex that territory and call it part of Russia. Today, Russia is willing to use its military and that's part of why we are worried about Russia's intent. If you're sitting anywhere in Europe today and you see the length of the Russian European border and you see the deployment of Russian tanks on the borders of Belarus and the borders of the Ukraine, you're nervous. You're nervous for good reason. And if you see President Putin talking about his military capability, you are nervous if you're the United States. It's why we see such a testy relationship between Merkel and Putin. Russia has also built an unprecedented capability, an unprecedented capability to engage in cyber attacks. We saw that during the 2016 election. We saw it recently with the hacking of solar winds and the Russian penetration of many major US um, uh, governmental computer systems and uh, um, not just governmental, but also private sector. We've also seen a willingness by the Russians to use their ability to destabilize the global order, to use their power to threaten, to threaten other countries, to make mischief at the United Nations and, and elsewhere. And that has made it much harder to keep kind of global stability across the world. Russia today is a security threat, and that's why our relationship is so rocky. Now, let's talk about interests for a minute. Both the US and Europe have interests in Russia. Russia has the world's second largest uh, oil supply, eighth largest oil supplies and second largest natural gas supplies. And much of the world is dependent on those supplies. Here you can see pipelines connecting Russia to most of Europe. 
That dependence on natural gas from Russia is critically important. Um, it is also, however, a reason that we have to be worried about Russia if you're in the United States itself, because those allies of the United States are going to depend on Russia. And it's also a problem that Russia is very willing to use leverage of natural gas against the United States and its allies. Russia's relevant to other US interests too. Russia claims a large hunk of the Arctic. That hunk of the Arctic that you see on the right-hand side of your screen is where some of the newest and most important shipping routes are in the world. As we've seen a melting of polar ice caps, it becomes possible to move goods, say from Busan in South Korea um, to St. Petersburg in Russia, much, much faster going across the north then across the South and around the Indian Ocean. Russia controls those sea lanes and Russia is willing to use its Arctic military capability to limit others use of those sea lanes. We have overlapping and interdependent interests, but not common goals. And because of that, it is not surprising that we have friction in the US-Russia relationship. We've talked about interests, we also have to talk about values. Russia has a set of values, but they're not necessarily aligned with those of the United States. Let's jump back historically to the leaders like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great who broke Russia out of its historic malaise and made Russia part of Europe. But they did so as strongman leaders, the czars who really exploited their countries and set a pattern that has continued ever since of leaders exploiting their people to try to improve Russia's economy and expand its power at the expense of its people. That proved very true during the Soviet Union, despite the fact, despite the fact that the Soviet Union was in theory a workers proletariat committed to workers' rights, Ultimately, it proved to be more about Stalin and Lenin and their, their successors' personal power and leadership. That's what led to the gulags of the Soviet Union. That's what led to the oppression of the Soviet people. And it was that huge conflict of values between the US and the Soviet Union that had a lot to do with the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, we thought Russia had adopted a new set of values. We thought that Yeltsin represented an adoption by Russia of American values. He was a democratically elected president, kind of. He believed, he said, in uh, constitutional rights, but he proved very weak. And what we quickly saw was that he was replaced by Putin and Putin has been anything but committed to American values. He's extended his presidency time and time again through constitutional sleight of hand. He has murdered um, uh, his opposition leaders in cold blood, just steps from the Kremlin. Today, the major Russian opposition leader, Navalny, who Putin tried to poison last year, is in jail in Russia. And we see more and more human rights violations coming out of Russia. More cases were brought from Russia than from any other country in Europe to the European Court of Human Rights. Protests about anything from gay rights to getting rid of Putin get broken down or blocked instantaneously. This is a, a, a protest out in the Russian Far East. The sign there says, Putin, you've lost my faith. You've lost my trust. What we have in Russia today is a strongman leader committed to showing the world just how strong he is. At times when his interests and values align with American leaders, perhaps there's a chance to get along. But those values do not fundamentally align with American values. And that is why American and Russian relations are so, so problematic. So what's the state of the relationship? Huge risks. The risk of cybersecurity breaches relying on Russia's incredible cyber hacking capability. Risks from new weapon systems that Putin has developed, like this Kinzhal missile that's hypersonic and can reach the United States in a matter, a matter of minutes. Are there any opportunities? Not many. The US and Russia have committed to trying to work out some sort of new arms control agreement. I hope we do, but I don't see a lot of room for improvement at the moment. 